Hey everyone, welcome back to all my listeners. This is episode 13 in season 11. Today's Wednesday, March 27th, 2024. My name is Sonal Patel and this is the Paint the Medical Picture podcast series. All right, you guys, let's dive right into today's episode. You know, it's the last Wednesday of the month. So it's my newsworthy fraud, waste and abuse highlights for the month of March. And of course, I'm going to be spotlighting some of those from the month's criminal and civil enforcement cases that I find newsworthy. And in my trusty tip, I wanted to highlight some Medicare claims processing manual updates. And of course, I'm going to go ahead and close out and round out today's episode with a remarkable quote on quality versus quantity by William Ellery Channing. This episode is sponsored by Advanced Coding Services. Let's get into it. Today's episode is sponsored by Advanced Coding Services, a leading medical billing and medical coding school in the United States. Whether you're just starting out or a seasoned professional, our training equips you with the tools and support you need to advance your career. Our medical billing and coding school meets your needs worldwide online or in person with one-on-one support throughout your training. We are committed to helping our alumni and credentialed medical community in keeping up their certifications by offering various avenues for acquiring your continuing education units. In addition to our Mastering the Business of Medicine retreats offered several times throughout the year in different parts of the country, we now offer memberships. You can conveniently earn your CEUs by attending our exclusive members-only webinars. Since our aim is to nurture and grow the careers of individuals who work in the business of medicine, we call our member area the Apple Orchard. Advanced Coding Services. Educate. Nurture. Inspire. Reaching back with a hand up. So let's get into Newsworthy. The month's fraud, waste, and abuse cases. The month of March saw a whopping 40 cases as of the recording of this episode. In mid-March, a New York hospital settles healthcare fraud claims for $17.3 million. Here, the settlement agreement requires the hospital to pay $17.3 million to resolve allegations that it paid unlawful kickbacks to physicians at the hospital's chemotherapy infusion center. The payments were made pursuant to a contractual arrangement that linked the compensation physicians received to the number of referrals the physicians made for services at the center. The agreement also resolves claims that physicians at the infusion center failed to adequately supervise the chemotherapy services. The settlement resolves claims under the federal and New York State False Claims Acts. Of the total settlement amount, $16.410 million is to be paid to the federal government and $890,000 is to be paid to New York State. The hospital voluntarily self-disclosed these issues to the United States. A U.S. attorney on the case stated, quote, this settlement addresses a compensation scheme that incentivized physicians to make referrals for services based on how much they would be paid and were essentially kickbacks, end quote. To ensure that physicians make medical decisions based solely on the needs of their patients, Medicare and Medicaid rules prohibit physicians from receiving any kind of remuneration in exchange for patient referrals for services. The United States investigation of the New York hospital found that physicians at a chemotherapy infusion center affiliated with the hospital were paid based in part on the volume of referrals they generated for it. Medicare and Medicaid rules also require that that those billing for medical services be involved in the services. A hospital, for instance, cannot bill for the services of a physician if that physician did not participate in the patient care. The rules recognize that non-physicians, like nurses, provide care to patients. Such care is permissible and often desirable. But in many instances, such care must be provided under the supervision of a physician who is available to assist in the care if need be. At the Infusion Center, at issue in this matter, Medicare and Medicaid were billed for services provided by non-physicians, even in instances in which physicians were not available to adequately supervise the services. Also in mid-March, the Justice Department sues six health plans and their alliance for concealing overpayments for military managed care programs. 
The United States filed a complaint alleging that six health plans participating in the Uniformed Services Family Health Plan, the USFHP program, as well as their trade group, the U.S. Family Health Plan Alliance, violated the False Claims Act by knowingly retaining erroneously inflated payments for health care services the health plans contracted to provide to retired military members and their families. The United States has also reached a settlement with a Department of Defense, or DOD, contractor, a consulting firm, related to this conduct. The USFHP program is one of the health care options available to military personnel, retirees, as well as their families. Six health plans are eligible to participate in this program, each of which is a defendant in the government's complaint. Through the USFHP program, the DOD pays the plans capitated rates to provide health care services to their enrollees. According to this complaint, in June 2012, the plans learned of calculation errors that had inflated the rates they had been paid in prior years. Nevertheless, the plans took steps to conceal the existence of these overpayments from the government and continued to submit invoices at the inflated payment rates. The complaint alleges that during discussions about rates for the subsequent year, some of the plans even asked the government to continue paying them at the prior inflated rates, even though, by at that time, those plans knew the rates were inflated by the errors. The United States filed its complaint in a lawsuit originally brought under the key TAM or whistleblower provisions of the False Claims Act by two parties in the District of Maine. The United States entered into a settlement agreement with a research and consulting firm located in Virginia that provides actuarial consulting services to the Defense Health Agency, or the DHA, in connection with the USFHP program. The settlement resolves allegations that the consulting firm failed to notify DHA about errors in executing the rate-setting methodology that caused the USFHP rates to be overstated and their impact on DHA's payments made to the plans. Under the terms of the settlement agreement, the consulting firm has agreed to pay the United States $779,951 plus interest, as well as contingent payments based on its annual contract revenue and cash reserves through the year 2025. The settlement amount is based on the firm's ability to pay. Mid-March also saw a Sandusky doctor sentenced to prison for illegally dispensing drugs to patients. This Ohio doctor was sentenced to prison by a U.S. district judge on the case after earlier pleading guilty to illegally dispensing narcotics to patients. He was sentenced to 42 months imprisonment to be followed by one year of home confinement for the first of three years of supervised release. He was also ordered to pay a special $100 assessment and restitution in the amount of over $860,000. According to testimony and court records, from January 2010 to August of 2018, the doctor repeatedly prescribed controlled substances outside the usual course of professional practice and not for a legitimate medical purpose, including powerful painkillers such as fentanyl, oxycodone, oxymorphone, and other drugs. He distributed narcotics that were not medically necessary by writing controlled substance prescriptions without first performing adequate patient physical examinations. He also used faulty diagnoses to prescribe excessive doses of controlled substances for long periods of time without evidence that the controlled substances were helping the patients, all while ignoring signs of addiction and drug abuse among those patients. He also profited significantly from prescribing subsists a particular branded formulation of fentanyl manufactured by Insys Therapeutics, Inc. Between 2013 and 2016, he received $175,000 from Insys for promoting the drug through Insys's Speakers Bureau program. During that same time, the doctor wrote 835 prescriptions for subsys. Mid-March also saw a St. Louis area pediatrician indicted accused of exchanging prescriptions for sex acts. This pediatrician was indicted and accused of prescribing pain pills and other controlled substances in exchange for sex acts or cash. 
The indictment charges this doctor with 17 counts of illegal distribution of controlled substances and six counts of making false statements related to health care matters. He, as well as a female accomplice, were also indicted on one count of conspiracy to distribute controlled substances. The indictment says that since at least 2014, the pediatrician allegedly repeatedly issued controlled substance prescriptions to numerous adult women, many of whom he met because he was their pediatrician when they were children. In exchange for sexual acts and sexual photographs without regard for the patient's medical condition or the medical necessity of the prescription. In many cases, he allegedly issued those controlled substance prescriptions, even though he knew the recipients had a substance use disorder and he knew that issuing the prescription was illegal and could endanger the recipient's mental health and physical safety, according to the indictment. He also allegedly pressured reluctant females to engage in sex acts at his pediatrics office. In a motion seeking to have the doctor held in jail until trial, the government alleges that investigators are aware of at least 25 individuals with whom he exchanged controlled substance prescriptions for sexual acts or cash. The indictment also alleges that he ignored widely known red flags that can indicate prescription drugs are being abused or sold, endangering the well-being of the patients and the community. The indictment also lists a series of examples. Examples like one patient met the pediatrician through a friend who told her that he would write any prescription she desired if she performed a sex act while topless. On numerous occasions, she did so or provided nude photos in exchange for Adderall, Xanax, and Percocet, according to the indictment. The indictment also alleges that he provided the same three drugs to another patient in exchange for sexual acts, despite knowing that she had a severe substance use disorder and was at high risk of overdose. The indictment further alleges that this female died of drug overdose in April of 2022 at the age of 40. The indictment also alleges that beginning in 2021, the female accomplice, who did not have any medical training, or a Drug Enforcement Administration registration allowing her to prescribe controlled substances, she agreed to distribute controlled substances under the doctor's DEA registration. The doctor issued controlled substance prescriptions to the female accomplice for sexual favors that he provided, according to the indictment. He knew that his female accomplice was selling some of these drugs he prescribed to her for cash, according to the indictment. He used the identities of third-party individuals, including the female accomplice's ex-husband, her mother, her friends, to either take advantage of their prescription insurance benefits or conceal from pharmacies the frequency with which she was receiving controlled substances prescribed by this doctor, according to the indictment. She also allegedly introduced the doctor to others who provided him with cash or sexual acts in exchange for prescriptions, according to the indictment. The charges of conspiracy and illegal distribution of controlled substances are each punishable by up to 20 years in prison, a $1 million fine, or both, prison and a fine. Each charge of making false statements is punishable by five years in prison, a $250,000 fine, or both. Charges set forth in an indictment are merely accusations and do not constitute proof of guilt. Every defendant is presumed to be innocent unless and until proven guilty. Mid-March saw a rock doc sentenced for opioid distribution conspiracy. Here, a Tennessee nurse practitioner known locally as the rock doc was sentenced to 20 years in prison for illegally prescribing opioids, including oxycodone and fentanyl, from his medical practice in Tennessee. A principal deputy assistant attorney general on the case stated, quote, the self-proclaimed rock doc abused the power of the prescription pad to supply his small community with hundreds of thousands of doses of highly addictive prescription opioids to obtain money, notoriety, and sexual favors, end quote. According to court documents and evidence presented at trial, this nurse practitioner illegally prescribed medically unnecessary controlled substance pills to hundreds of patients, including a pregnant woman and women with whom he was having inappropriate physical relationships.
He maintained a party type atmosphere at his clinic and prescribed these drugs, at least in part to boost his popularity on social media and promote a self-produced reality TV show pilot based on his self-identified persona, The Rock Doc. He prescribed more than 100,000 doses of hydrocodone, oxycodone, and fentanyl into the community. Now, there were many, many of the other usual suspects as well, from nursing abuses, COVID-19 schemes, foot bath and pain cream schemes, DME fraud, and even more and more kickbacks and bribery schemes. But I wanted to pay particular attention to a case involving a former Georgia insurance commissioner pleading guilty in a health care fraud scheme. The former Georgia state insurance commissioner pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit health care fraud in which a co-conspirator and he referred unnecessary medical tests to a lab company in Texas in return for hundreds of thousands of dollars in kickbacks. According to the charges and other information presented in court, the former Georgia insurance commissioner conspired with an ENT physician and others to submit fraudulent insurance claims for medically unnecessary pharmacogenetic, molecular genetic, and toxicology testing. Physicians associated with the ENT practice were pressured to order these medically unnecessary tests from a lab in Texas. As part of this healthcare fraud scheme, the lab agreed to pay the former Georgia insurance commissioner and the ENT physician a kickback of 50% of the net profit for eligible specimens submitted by the ENT practice to the lab company. In connection with the scheme, the former Georgia insurance commissioner gave a presentation at the Ritz-Carlton where he pressured doctors in the ENT practice to order the unnecessary tests. The lab later submitted insurance claims seeking more than $2.5 million in payments from private health insurers for the unnecessary tests. The insurance companies paid almost $700,000 to the lab because of these fraudulent claims. The lab then paid $260,000 in kickbacks to the former Georgia insurance commissioner and the ENT doctor. Some patients were also charged for the tests, receiving bills of up to $18,000. To conceal these kickback payments, the duo arranged for the payments to be made from the lab to the former Georgia insurance commissioner's insurance consulting business. He also used a portion of the kickback money to pay debts for the ENT physician also a $150,000 charitable contribution, and finally $70,000 in attorney's fees. When a compliance officer at the ENT practice raised concerns about the kickbacks, the former Georgia insurance commissioner told the ENT doctor to lie and say the payments from him were loans. He also allegedly directed the ENT doctor to repeat the lie after he was questioned by federal agents about the Texas lab. And when interviewed about the lab by an Atlanta publication in connection with a private lawsuit, the former Georgia insurance commissioner falsely denied working with the lab company or receiving money from the business. And now it's time for my best practice tips in trusty tip. There are new updates being made to the Medicare claims processing manual. The Medicare Claims Processing Manual is updating HCPCS billing codes and Advanced Beneficiary Notice of Non-Coverage Requirements, or ABN Requirements, for Initial Preventive Physical Examinations, or IPPEs, as well as Annual Wellness Visit Services, or AWVs. Now, your coding and billing staffs should be aware to utilize HCPCS codes G0402, G0438, and G0439, and not CPT codes 99381 through CPT code 99397 for these service lines. However, CMS is encouraging physicians to give patients an ABN for these certain preventive services for CPT codes 99381 through 99397 as a courtesy to the patient to be aware of their possible financial obligations. Both the effective and implementation dates of this update is scheduled for May 15th, 2024. And finally, I focus Season 11 Spark on quality versus quantity. I want this 11th season Spark to be filled with our world's thought leaders, writers, artists, philosophers, everyone who inspires the need for better understanding of quality versus quantity. 
So in this week's inspiring quote, in Spark is from William Ellery Channing. It is not the quantity, but the quality of knowledge which determines the mind's dignity. So very true, right? This quote reassures us that it is the quality of knowledge that is important. This quote reminds us that just doing something robotically does not mean we actually learn or gain value or quality knowledge. This quote encourages us that building a foundation of quality knowledge serves a greater purpose than simply amassing the quantity. I'm happy William Ellery Channing's spark burns brightly in all of us today. So that wraps up today's episode. And as always, I appreciate you all diving into today with me. If you want more information from me, please go ahead and follow me on LinkedIn. I'll leave links to everything in the show notes below. All right, you guys, remember to catch my LinkedIn live broadcast with Betty Hovey on Friday for our very last March compliance capers. We devoted this entire month of March on the OIG work plan and the various closed reports with findings. Now, the full video versions can also be found on my YouTube channel for Paint the Medical Picture. Thanks so much for all of your continued support, you guys. I wish you all an amazing and very, very happy week ahead. And let's look forward to what the new month of April has in store for all of us. Thanks so much for listening in on today's episode. And I hope every week with me brings you closer to helping your providers paint a masterpiece. See you next Wednesday.